This morning we heard an interesting, uh, a number of interesting sessions about, uh, about doom and gloom to a certain extent, about debt to GB, uh, GDP ratios which are becoming excessive, um, European banks which are possibly undercapitalized. But I think the great thing about this industry is the fact that we have, as we've always said, the whole world um, is a market for us. And today we have with us a number of distinguished guests who can uh, share with us their vision um, and their experiences, their overseas experiences, and what they think the future lies. We have um, a far left, um, Kurt Camper, then um, Professor Drew Markson, Francis Vassallo, Mario Portelli, and all the way from Hong Kong by satellite, we have Maria. Um, what I'd like to do is basically go through with our panelists here and ask them to, um, to share their views and share their experiences about what they're seeing from outside the EU. Maria, if I can start with you, you have, you're, you're a senior partner with Deloitte in Hong Kong. You've been there for about 25 years. You work in the field of financial services. You clearly are very integrated into the um, Far East culture. And if I can share this story, when, when Maria and I first met about a month ago in Malta, uh, and we both are from the same office effectively, and, and we shared, we exchanged visiting cards, um, Maria very formally and graciously in a way that only people accustomed to uh, Eastern cultures would do. She exchanged her visiting card with me in a manner which showed that clearly Maria, after 25 years, is very much integrated in the, in, in the Eastern culture. So Maria, um, my question for you is this. What are you seeing from, from, where you, from where you sit today? What do you think are the, are the opportunities um, for financial services practitioners in Malta in looking at your part of the world. What, what's the view from there? Uh, thanks, Malcolm, for that introduction. And uh, I hope now that the technology does not fail me. Um, um, I heard you say that you were hearing uh, uh, this morning about some uh, gloom and doom. Um, fortunately, I'm in this part of the world where it's not yet gloom and doom. It's uh, actually still um, a good environment that we're working in. Um, so if uh, one is looking for opportunities, the Asia-Pacific region still has a lot to offer. We still are experiencing high economic growth, and although it is slowing down, China's GDP growth is still expected to be 7.5% for this year. Um, we are seeing um, other uh, parts of uh, Asia that are also doing quite well. So economically, um, I can say that uh, Asia is still the place to be. Now, from the financial services sector's point of view, what we've seen in recent years is that there's been more opening up of the market for financial services. So the regulatory reforms are now opening up markets that were previously closed. Um, another um, uh, important uh, development uh, is the uh, um, growth of wealth management services because of the uh, growing wealth and prosperity in the middle class. Only about uh, three weeks ago, I think, I read an article about UBS unit that is uh, aiming to double up its business because of the high rate of economic growth and the increasing fund flows into Asia. So we're seeing uh, companies from Europe coming to this part of the world and their expectation is that the uh, wealth that uh, exists here will more than compensate for some of the outflows that they are experiencing in Europe. Um, another uh, change that I would like to highlight to you is uh, related to reforms that are uh, occurring in Hong Kong. 
Now, Hong Kong to me, in a way, is similar to Malta. It's another small island, and it's thriving on financial services. And what it, it has to its advantage is China as its Cinderland. And the reforms that it's building on are in connection with China. So now it's trying to move away from distribution of funds into creating these funds. Um, uh, they, it's been um, it's developing a number of uh, products in RMB. There's a lot of, of uh, interest to go into uh, the China market, and uh, Hong Kong is acting as a facilitator to tap that market. So it's been issuing bonds, it's been issuing equities. So a lot of the products are being developed out of Hong Kong to tap that market. A very recent development is uh, something that's being worked out between the Hong Kong uh, um, government and the Chinese regulators to enable the mutual recognition of funds. So the arrangement that they're trying to work out is to enable the cross-border selling of funds. So the Hong Kong uh, institutions will be able to sell the Hong Kong or other funds that they're authorized to sell into the China market and vice versa. This has been welcomed by uh, the asset manage managers here in Hong Kong, but also we've so seen a lot of interest from outside Hong Kong. So I can foresee that there's a lot of opportunities for the uh, players in the financial services sector. Okay. Thank and you, Maria. So broadly, I would say the, these are the uh, drivers uh, and the opportunities in Asia. Okay. But Thank there you, are Maria. some I'm going to have to stop you because we are, we are really running short of time mm -hmm. here. And, and I'll come back to you if you can just, uh, you just uh, stay there with us. Uh, if I can go on to you, Kurt. Um, a private banker by profession, you, you know Malta well. You've been coming here for about 20 years. You've advised a number of clients to set up funds in Malta. Swiss national, what is the Swiss view? What do you think are the opportunities for professional service providers in Malta to, to work on Switzerland? Uh, <coughs> Switzerland, but the Swiss uh, financial services industry and the banks, Malta is very attractive for the simple reason we are outside of the EU. And whatever we do, whether we form funds in Malta or whether we set up a business activity of any kind, we have entered through this door the, into the EU. In that, because I got to know Malta via HSBC, for, I worked for them. And one day the chairman called me in and said, on your way to Europe or back, we have to make a stopover in Malta to see what's going on there. And the attraction of the Far East is the same as for the Swiss. It doesn't only go for financial services, also for business activity, for import, export, business, whatever. So you think, from a Swiss perspective, I think the great thing we have to offer is our EU membership and the fact that we can be used as a gateway uh, for Swiss investment into the European market. That's it. Okay, excellent. Drew Markson. Yes. Yesterday I learned that you were uh, a commodities floor trader for a number of years in New York. Yeah, that's correct. You, um, you lectured derivatives in the, on the Joburg Stock Exchange. You uh, are a adjunct professor of financial services at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law and you spend much time in the U.S. Virgin Islands and also in South Africa. Yeah, that's correct. What are you, what are you seeing? What, what's in your crystal ball? What can you see from your end? Okay, first I'll just discuss the backdrop of what I see going forward uh, and give you some history on where I'm coming from. And in the second part, after the rest of my panelists have spoken, I'll give specifics of what I'm doing in terms of execution to take advantage of my uh, views. Uh, really, we have to go back to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Uh, it was initiated uh, directly or at least indirectly by the U.S. mortgage-backed securities uh, market. 
uh, and then uh, it spread via contagion so that there was a dramatic uh, re-rating and repricing of all weak risk assets around the globe. The response to this crisis was a massive monetary response. Uh, at first, it was conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, um, followed by the Bank of England, and then the ECB, and on and on to the emerging market, to the so-called BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, all followed easy monetary policies, right on to today where the major proponent of this is the Bank of Japan. Okay. Um, I believe that this was the correct first step uh, to the crisis. However, unfortunately, it has been the only game in, in town uh, for far too long, and as a result, we are now moving into a stage where risks are dramatically rising if we continue with this as our solo response to the crisis. So we need to keep this in mind. While things look okay, they look rosy right now, things may seem fine for risk assets, we need to keep in mind that there's risks going forward. Um, one indicator I look at right now, if, I had, if you had to say what's the one indicator I look at around the world, there's a massive carry trade. It's being initiated by uh, basically institutional level investors, hedge funds, etc. They are borrowing Japanese yen, which is, has almost a zero interest rate to borrow. And of course, it's being printed in massive quantities. It's the stated objective of both the Central Bank of Japan and the government of Japan. Uh, they are then investing in risk assets. The first one they're going to is the Australian dollar. Why the Australian dollar? As far as I can tell, Australia is the only major country that's following a monetary policy substantially different from the rest of the world. Their interest rates, they actually have inflation-adjusted positive returns. The Reserve Bank of Australia is actually shrinking its balance sheet. So you have two players on the opposite side of the fence. Watch that every day. When that Australian dollar Japanese yen corrected last week, we had the massive correction and volatility spill into the gold market first, commodities, stocks, and eventually bonds. I see the bond markets have rallied tremendously as a result of some of these moves. Even the Spanish bonds, which I believe were characterized this morning uh, in the, the presentation um, as being um, ugly, have rallied to 4% yields. And Italy, which is characterized as being bad, their uh, bond have also rallied and interest rates have declined to approximately 4%. So with that in mind, we've, we've had an underlying restructuring that's needed to really restructure the economic fundamentals that really caused these crises. And it caused these crises in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and in the emerging markets. And this restructuring has been proceeding in a half-hearted, uncoordinated, and at times, a disorganized and mishandled manner. Um, this process is actually not moving forward in the correct way, I believe, nor at the correct pace. And in fact, if you think about it, not much has changed in the last five years since the financial crisis, and time is starting to run out. Why do I say that? Because of business cycles. No matter what we've done with monetary policy, we have not repealed the business cycle. And if you look at it, periodically, <coughs> the world has economic downturns. In 1980, the United States had a cyclical downturn. In 1982, it had another cyclical downturn. In 1987, it had a brief cyclical downturn. Uh, in 1990 to 1991, there was a cyclical downturn. In 2000 to 2001, with the popping of the IT bubble, there was a cyclical downturn. And on and on to 2007 and 8. We're five years past that. Time is running out on this economic cycle. We're one to three years away from another economic setback, a, a cyclical decline in activity, which is going to put huge stresses on the system. So that's my backdrop. I'll go over my specifics uh, okay. later. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Francis um, needs a little introduction to the, uh, to the Maltese, a um, distinguished career with Chase, governor of the Central Bank, um, recently government's special envoy to, to Latin America to look at tax treaties. Latin America is a huge continent. What are the, what are the views from there? What's your, what's your take? Under the previous, well, during the previous government, the uh, policy was set up to look beyond Europe and to look at other areas. Because of my background in Latin America, I used to be responsible for commodity financing with Chase in Latin America, and therefore I knew the markets quite well, and because of my language skills. Uh, the government had, a, had discussed this and, and decided the policy 
to open up the doors as uh, basically and Anthony Fisher mentioned this morning the key to the key to the success of water was increasing double taxation treaty ne um, networks you know and thank you and Anthony for bringing down memory lane <laughs> The Latin American issue is a very serious one. Malta was uh, blacklisted in basically every single country in Latin America. Our blacklisting was due to ignorance, was due to lack of knowledge about where Malta was, confusion as to where Malta was, the sovereign rights of Malta or the Republic of Malta. We were asked many times how many hospitals have we built in Malta in, in Latin America. I mean, these were the type of questions. So the first question was negotiating with all the ambassadors to try and take us away from the blacklist. Just one quick anecdote. The, the funniest blacklist I ever saw was the Venezuelan blacklist when the ambassador from Venezuela told me, we cannot negotiate, discuss a treaty because more is on our blacklist. I said, how will you do negotiating with your own government because you are on your own blacklist? <laughs> so they quickly removed it. Obviously, people were doing cut and paste blacklists all over the world. Uh, we opened up the doors. We, today, Malta is no longer listed as blacklist in the country. The only country which remains which is questionable whether we're on the blacklist or not is Argentina, because Argentina obviously won doesn't want a treaty. They're closing up the treaties, and Argentina wants to do an exchange of information, which obviously for us it's more important to do a treaty. Going right down the road, what is Latin America to Malta? Uh, we embarked on the process of why to attract Malta uh, to a Latin American country. We're talking about 400,000 people against 50, 16 million populations in some countries. We focused on two things. One, Malta is a European Union member state. Malta can be an excellent also lobbyist from the political point of view. And I'm not talking here financial services only. We're talking about Malta as a country. And Malta can be a fantastic exhibition location in the European Union for export products of Latin American countries and to use logistically, uh, logistically the export trade to come via Malta using the Malta Freeport and do a logistic basis of Malta. That attracted them very much because all Latin American exports go to the Panama Canal, those who are on the western coast of Latin America, Panama Canal go, go to Rotterdam or to Hamburg. Very few ships come through here. With Malta Freeport here, they can send more containers here, cheaper costs of uh, Freight because they could negotiate 30 containers instead of one. Just in time production, having Malta here as a logistic base. So therefore, if in an Italian product, a Libyan customer, North American, North African customer whose market was not penetrated by Latin America at all, so Malta was the key nerve center to operate for Latin for Latin Americans in Southern Europe and North Africa. We were ideal based. And, uh, and therefore, you know, and also I'll take a particular example, which was an example of one of the biggest Latin American countries where they have export agency. We used to have Metco in the olden days in Malta. This particular country exhibits in fairs internationally in Spain or whatever it is, the products. They are competing with other countries in the same location. And the exhibits are for two weeks or one week. We, the Malta government at that time, and I hope this new government will continue the policy, was to offer this, these countries uh, location in Malta, a permanent place, so that they can use the exhibitors. It's a win-win for two reasons. One, the Latin American exporter has a 360-day exhibition in Malta of the products. Two, the small and middle-sized industri industrialists, business people in Europe, can't afford to go to Mexico, Chile, and other, uh, Peru to find out. It's too expensive. Uh, and the win-win also, we will increase our tourism. So it's not just. The third part of the argument, because we're not just looking at financial services, we're looking at tourism, industry, Malta enterprise, the whole aspect of Latin America. And the final part was the financial services. Obviously, using a Maltese company investing in Europe, which is, as you we all said before, Malta is one of the best exit routes to extract EU dividends outside of the EU, okay, because of the no withholding tax, and obviously Latin America, which is very good. We chose, we chose when we, we highlighted the countries we wanted to, we chose first Uruguay. Why Uruguay? Uruguay is the Switzerland of Latin America. Uruguay is ideal. Everybody goes through Uruguay to enter Latin America. As you know, we signed a very good treaty, for those who have seen it, which is 
excellent. It has a clause in that treaty which was unique, and now today the Malta government is adopting that same clause in other countries, which is also we, we, introduced, the, we introduced the concept of um, a taxable person being a collective investment scheme. Okay? And if you look at Uruguayan economy, it's taxation, it's a domestic taxation, which means they only tax on income earned in Uruguay. So income earned in Brazil, income earned in Chile, income earned all over the world is not taxed. So with the Uruguayan company, in Malta invest into Uruguay, Uruguay invests into Latin America, that income around is not taxed. So therefore, that was one of the major advantages. Can I stop you there? I apologize, but uh, interest of time. Mario, about 10 years in the uh, Middle almost. East, yeah, almost, almost in Bahrain particularly, but you, I know you've, uh, you're an yeah. older partner with PwC. You have a number of um, important financial services clients. You are also very much in contact with Malta. What is, the, what is the view oh, yeah. from uh, your part of the world? Well, in the Middle East, I think I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, because it's, uh, the, the, if I ask if there is a crisis, they would say, what crisis? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I, I have some statistics with me. In the Middle East, it's a lot of Arab countries, but just focusing on one sector, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, it's a young population, high GDP. If I take Saudi Arabia, population is 26 million. GDP is $650 billion. And the average age in Saudi Arabia is 25 years. Compare that to Germany, 82 million population, $98 billion, uh, $330 billion of GDP. Average age is 44 years. So the potential in terms of economics in the GCC is, is, is tremendous. I, I learned the meaning of the word big when I actually went to Saudi Arabia. Uh, if we take Qatar, which is the new kid on the block, uh, it's 1.4 million in terms of population, and in the Super 5 Lottery of Life, they, they really hit the jackpot. It's 98 billion of GDP. So it's a relatively young, young region, uh, massive infrastructure. They're building everything, starting hospitals, schools, roads, airlines, uh, refineries. There's a lot of oil, obviously. And financial services is another sector which is quite growing in, in, in the Middle East. Because oil is finite resource. Uh, if you take Dubai as an example, Dubai doesn't have that much oil. Most of the income of Dubai is coming from financial services, tourism, logistics. Um, Saudi Arabia is totally different because- uh, Do they know about us? They, they're starting to know a little bit about us, but they don't know much about us. If, if, if I am dealing with, and I deal with sovereign wealth funds as well, and I see a lot of structuring of investments in Europe, um, they would rather go to Luxembourg, uh, not Malta. And it's a marketing uh, thing, and it's a policy choice that, that needs to be done, whether to focus in terms of awareness in the Middle East or not. Um, taking a theme from this morning, uh, the Middle Eastern investor is very much concerned about reputation, and I'm talking here about sovereign wealth funds. So the regulatory regime is, is the main selling point of Malta. Cost doesn't tend to be an issue uh, for, for these people. So it's reputation, regulation, and access to other markets. So that is the, the niche that Malta can play in the, in the Middle East. Uh, Maria, um, back to you. Any, any particular products um, and structures which you think um, we should be thinking about if we want to attract um, clients from... from um, from the Far East? Um, the uh, type of products that I've been uh, seeing in the past few years uh, related to group structuring. I've been noticing that because of the uh, um, favorable tax treatment and the double tax uh, treaties that exist, um, some companies are using Malta as a ship purpose vehicle. For example, I've been seeing some funds that set up a company in Malta to hold an investment in Korea. And the primary purpose is uh, to uh, minimize the withholding tax. So the favorable tax treaty that uh, I apply uh, currently helps them in that respect. Another structure that I've seen is involving um, a company that holds the patent patented rights. Um, that is the Maltese company, and uh, I understand that the uh, main reason is because of the tax uh, treatment of royalties. 
So that's an area where Malta can play a big part um, for structuring. And of course, the other part will be using Malta as the entry point into Europe. So uh, Malta being the uh, factory for uh, um, EU-based uh, investments into funds, those could then be sold into Asia. Uh, only last week, we had a contingent from Ireland that was uh, highly promoting Ireland. So Malta could do the same and uh, be the um, country of choice for such funds with some promotion. Those Thank are the two main areas that I've seen so far. Thank you, Maria. Um, for Switzerland, Kat, what, what do you think? Any particular products we should uh, uh, be looking at to try and attract uh, Swiss investors? When we started out, we had to use a platform we couldn't just take as a person and say, go to Malta, it's great, and you can have everything. But by establishing this Swiss Small Tees Chamber of Commerce, we created an unpretentious platform where we could inform people. And because it's coming from a Chamber of Commerce, it has added value. And you have a permanent presence. It's not you go there and to, to talk to people, we are there. We are a member of the Swiss Jam. That's the association of all chambers in Switzerland. So we have access and we try to use this, this access by coming out with a newsletter which constantly will be reporting on Malta new developments there, and so it, to have the presence, the permanent presence, and I think this is the most important thing. And because you got also feedback, in other words, if people don't like certain things, you get to know, and you can pass it on back to Malta to remedy the situation. And we also have had some complaints, not a lot, that maybe a more, a Swiss importer was not so happy with his counterparty in Malta. They couldn't get any further with him, but they came to us and we intervened via the, cha the Malta Chamber of Commerce. So this concept has given us the platform and the volume speaks for itself, and I saw today how many funds were formed in total in Malta, Switzerland has contributed a sizable amount. Thank you. Drew, anything sure. specific uh, yeah. you can see, that you can share with us? Yeah, as I mentioned, I look at the risk barometer, the Australian dollar rate every day. If Australian dollar is rising relative to Japanese yen, I'm risk on, looking for risk assets. So I'm doing the usual thing that everyone else does. I'm accumulating US equities, et cetera. I'm going further out on the risk curve, which is intended by this quantitative easing policies of Ben Bernanke, Mario Draghi, et cetera. Uh, so I am going out on the narrow tree branch to try to uh, take on risk. But I'm mindful of the following. I characterize this market and, and this structure that we're in, this market microstructure, as picture an escalator. So everyone's standing on an escalator, going up the steps nice and slowly, and then some person flicks a switch where the escalator steps all of a sudden turn into a chute and everyone slides down. I believe we are in an up the escalator, down the chute pattern, similar to what Chuck Prince, the Citigroup chairman, referred to before the last financial crisis when he said, you gotta keep your dancing shoes on until the music shuts off, meaning you've gotta keep on going out on the risk curve, keep on going out on the risk curve, but unfortunately, you need to also be mindful that you might wanna get off the dance floor a little bit early. Um, so I'm mindful of that. How do I deal with that? I have found a great asset class that it's unique in its time and space right now. It's basically getting long volatility. How do you get long volatility? I can tell you two ways I do it and why. The two ways to do it is you're buying option contracts and then delta hedging those using the Black-Scholes option pricing model. It's a bit complex, not for everybody. It would only be people who are familiar with options. There is a second way to do it that we've just researched by using pu publicly traded available instruments also. Um, there are futures contracts on volatility instruments. In the United States, it's the VIX futures contract. 
uh, or the Barclays iShare iPath uh, symbol VXX, short-term volatility, uh, uh, it's like a share, it's an exchange-traded fund. You need to be careful of that because it has certain impediments in the design that you'll need to research. I'm using the VIX futures to do this. What I found with volatility is it's autocorrelative and mean reverting. What that really means is that when it's cheap, it will have a tendency to go up like a magnet. There's an average volatility that most asset classes trade at. And right now in the United States, for example, the volatility levels are below their long-term means. They're below it. So we have the magnet getting ready to act to pull it up. The second thing is that volatility is autocorrelative. What that just means is it's a trend-following product. If volatility is higher today than yesterday, there's a greater likelihood than 50% that it'll be higher tomorrow. So I wait for that setup. I don't just mindlessly go out and buy a uh, VIX. Do, sorry, we can oh. just conclude because we are. Okay, we, sure, we're running off. No, 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 just finish off that sentence. I'll finish it up, yeah. So what you need to do is wait for the setup. Wait for the, the key setup. The setup is if volatility as measured by the VIX futures is higher than yesterday, buy. Stay with that until such time as the price is lower than yesterday. If tomorrow the price is lower, get out right away. You've got to cut your losses quickly, ride the trend rapidly, test it, back test it for all you hedge fund guys out there. It works, and it's cheap and timely. Okay, thank you. Francis, 30 seconds. There's Quick. A third way. <laughs> Set up a company in Malta and get tax efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> the, the Latin America, the products there are, one, funds selling into Malta and selling Sorry, send it into Latin America. We should be an excellent location to attract foreign funds to set up in Malta directly towards Latin America because why we've set up with this British treaty network. That's number one. Two, the holding companies, obviously, because it's very attractive with no dividend withholding tax on the way out. The governments of Latin America are interested in it because there's more tax to collect because there's no withholding tax there. And the third one is the logistics. It's very important that people who might not be here, the logistic companies, should start marketing heavily these companies because it is a niche market. They don't have North Africa market for Latin America is out completely. And what applies to Latin America, by the way, with Hong Kong on the market, the same applies to China, using Malta as a logistic place for to selling into Europe. Excellent. Thank you. Mario? 20 se seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. If I had to pick one product, it will be PIFs. Uh, I think that is a natural choice, uh, but, but there needs to be an Islamic flavor to it uh, because there's a lot of pension funds, a lot of insurance companies that obviously have an overlay of Islamic principles, so that is some, some area that needs to be looked at. And there is a perception even, I think, being growing up in Malta, uh, that there is something bad with the Middle East or it's all terrorists, and I think the, the root cause for that is the the fable, Alibaba and the 40 thieves. Yes. So it's one good guy to 40 bad guys. And I can assure you, it's not, the ratio is much, much better than that. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so in conclusion, um, as we, I think we, we've heard, it's not all bad news. We are lucky, we work in an industry that offers us opportunities way beyond our European borders. We've had our distinguished panel to share their thoughts with us. So I think really it's a matter of going out and, and trying to get that business which is available for us to get outside Europe. Thank you very much.